Dash, and welcome to Queer Magic. It's great to have you on. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, fair warning, my dog just walked in the room. So if there's some animal sounds behind me, that's, that's of course, right before we were talking without the recording <laughs> elsewhere. We hit the record button. Yes, Pets and come, my partner is downstairs in the basement doing things to our temple ceiling. So um, <laughs> awesome. you might hear banging in the background. Yeah. No so, worries. No worries. Yeah, interesting sound. Uh, anyway, yeah, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Oh, welcome. Um, so uh, I think we've known each other online or been in the same online spaces for about a decade. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so tell us about how long you've been involved in paganism and parts of sure. it. Yeah, so I I've been I've been sort of noodling around in the in in the the pagan community now for probably like 22, 23 years. Uh, for me, going all the way back to high school, um, and then like really in in college, I was technically the president of the undergraduate pagan students organization at my alma mater, but that was because everybody else graduated and I was the only one left. <laughs> so, uh, and then when I, when I sort of got my first job after college, I, I, I got more heavily involved as a staff person for a university of it, for the university of Illinois. I met a bunch of people there who were pagan and who were, uh, building the, the pagan students association there. And so that's sort of like the first, my first sort of foray into a larger community space where, uh, we didn't always do work together. Like it wasn't a coven. It wasn't a group. Uh, it wasn't even, everybody wasn't even in the same way of paganism, but it was a community of folk that got together and tried to learn from and, and, and share knowledge with each other. And that was really, and that was really quite cool. Um, and it was also while I was out in Illinois, so this is the aughts basically, that I started to connect with some of the other organizations of paganism and did some work with the Pagan Newswire Collective and did some work with uh, eventually the, just doing some like programming. I'm a computer uh, programmer, software developer. So I did some programming for the Wild Hunt a few times, stuff like that, just sort of not really necessarily being a trailblazer or, or a leader all the time, but being there and being willing to help out and lend some of my digital talents to assist uh, assist where, where needed. Uh, so I've been around uh, a while, and like you said, sort of in some of the same spaces as you for, for quite some time, and just sort of doing what I do. And then uh, I got to DC, where I live. I live in the DC area now, Washington, DC. And that was where I finally sort of settled into a, a community here with the Firefly House in, in Washington, uh, initiated there. Uh, and now I and, uh, and a handful of the other initiates sort of run the calendar of events for that organization as best we can. So it's a group effort uh, of myself and five, six other people uh, here in the area that try to keep that organization going and, and keep it operating with some events and, and our classes and our uh, in the before COVID times are public rituals, but that's obviously on pause until we we move into whatever is next uh, with respect to social gatherings, um, and uh, and that's been that's been an interesting role to have during the last year to year or so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've started organizing online rituals, and it's a very different yeah. experience, definitely. Um, yeah, like I've always, you know, I also being a software developer. Um, yeah, I think we've had a few geeky conversations about that in the past as well. So yeah, pretty cool. Um, so yeah, tell us a bit about your position on the queer landscape, as it were. Yeah, so I am trans and non-binary. Uh, and that's, that's my, that's like, if there's a map, that's where my pin sits. So I have, I think, always been queer, like a lowercase Q, as opposed to capital Q, like part of a community. Uh, even going back to when I was younger, there were a lot of people that really just could tell and would tell me <laughs> uh, that I just didn't quite fit. And I knew it, they knew it. Um, I found out in undergraduate, uh, before I started dating the person who would, I would later marry, uh, the the large friend group that we both shared uh, had actually assumed that I was gay because I hadn't had a date in like three years. I was like, well, if I was gay, I could have had a date, just would have been with somebody probably male, you know, like 
being gay doesn't mean you don't get a date. I don't understand where this is coming from, but anyway. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think for a long time, I and others could kind of tell that, that there was a separation between me and a sense of authenticity about myself. And it really wasn't until about the last four or five years that I had an inkling uh, that I had an inkling about that, that it was gender uh, and not sexuality that, that my sort of line of queerness uh, mm. existed. And I just didn't have vocabulary for it. Uh, and I started encountering websites and places online that were telling me more about gender studies and the, and the spectrum and galaxy of non-binary options. For a while, I started to use demigender uh, as a term uh, but eventually just, to, and that was mostly because I wanted to try to hang on to the he, him pronouns that I had used for, at that point, probably 36, 37 years. Yeah. Um, but even that just, I knew it wasn't quite right. So it was actually, and perhaps um, unexpectedly, the first day that I attended in-person classes at a United Methodist Christian seminary that I introduced myself to the rest of my class as David Dashifin Key's pronouns, they, them. And I wouldn't have done it if there weren't a bunch of other people in that classroom that also introduced themselves with they, them pronouns. And I came to find out that some of them <laughs> that I was using for my support, they looked around the room and saw us doing it with, and were using us for their support. So there was this really weird, like mutual support going on in that room. And none of us knew, <laughs> none of us had any clue until like two years later when we're talking about it. And they were like, I did it because you did it. And I was like, I did it because you did it. And you did it because cause they did it. And and we realized that like we had, we, so we, we propped each other's up without even knowing it. <laughs> That's awesome. Somebody had to be the first to actually yeah, do it. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember <laughs> who wrote it down first. Cause we, we of course made little like table tent cards with our names oh, on yeah. one side so everybody could see it. We were sort of in a horseshoe, set, horseshoe shape. And so I don't remember now, unfortunately, who actually did it first, but whoever, whoever did that first really uh, broke the mold for a few other people in the room. <laughs> That's awesome. And also, I think it really helps, you know, if you're in a situation where somebody says, right, please share your pronouns, right. um, then you know it's safe to share your real pronoun, True. right? Um, True. And yeah, so I, I decided to be a full-time they when um, publishing the latest two books because, mm. uh, you know, um, I mean, I'm sort of they with he tendencies so it's like sure. um sure. yeah what to do like I, in the end i'm just like oh okay they works best i think yeah yeah well and i i do think that there's a th there is something to there is something to claiming the pronouns that feel right to you as a person authentically and publicly. It is a coming out in the same way that uh -huh. uh, coming out uh, along the vector of sexuality is a coming out. Uh, and so there's something about, in my case, I, I can't speak for you or others, but in my case, I, I really felt like there was something about somebody who has the privilege that I do uh, walking around in my white skin and my male shaped body uh, that when I made a statement, I kind of knew that I would be okay, but I also knew that not everybody might be in that situation. So if I can, if I can knock down some barriers for other people just by doing what feels right to myself, like why not do that? Um, yeah, I know awesome. there's other people who don't always feel that way, who think that it's a more of a political statement and there's a little bit, there's sometimes there is ego in it. It feels good. I like it. I prefer it this way. So it's, I'm not saying like it's all altruism, but um but uh, it seems it seemed like the right thing to do at the time, yeah. Uh, and it it hasn't steered me wrong uh, so far. Yeah, that's, that's great. Someplace. And I, <laughs> I think um, I don't know. It, it, it also depends on context a lot as well. So sure, it's kind of tricky stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there you go. But yeah, that's awesome. Um, so your uh, your tell me about the Firefly House. I don't know anything about that. And, uh, sure. what, and are they, um, presumably they are very affirming of queer identity, so. Yes, yeah. We have in the Firefly House, I would say going back, the earliest I could really find uh, going back through the web archive and, and, and our history, the earliest I found was uh, 2011. We were already sort of talking about queer identity and trans identities, sometimes in specific, that, uh, and so in support of those identities and that queerness within paganism. Um, so the, we've had so many members that are somewhere in 
the the queer community that it's it would be it would be almost impossible for us not to have we wouldn't have a we wouldn't have a firefly house if we if we didn't include queer people like it's 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 a vast plurality if not a majority of us um the firefly house itself is a sort of pan-pagan non-exclusive group so we don't necessarily require anybody to believe a certain thing we we do refer to ourselves as a tradition but if i'm being honest i think it's more uh, what, while we, we it it lacks the sort of the trappings of the the initiate the initiatory traditions mm. that were coming out of like the mid uh, 20th century and things of that sort, we do have initiation rituals. We do have some some ways that we do different holidays and things of that sort. So I think if you give us enough time, mm. we might be able to resolidify some ideas in a way that we're doing them. Um, but I, we have always been a little bit more focused on the community aspects, the friendship aspects, the magical aspects, and the, um, the building of, of a space here in the nation's capital for, for paganism. And we're not the only ones doing that. There's a, there's a huge number of pagan groups here in DC. It's really quite amazing. Um, and uh, yeah, so we we sort of just do what we do. Uh, we tried it. We have in the past done public rituals in the parks, uh, in and around the D.C. and Northern Virginia areas. Uh, we've do uh, classes in the spring. Uh, I'm actually working to with others to build some sort of like 201 and 301 level classes that we might be able to do during other parts of the year, so that there's a little bit more opportunity for people who have been around the pagan community for five, six, seven, eight, 10, 20 years and want something that isn't the, this is the wheel of the year class over and over again, which is important, but maybe not if you know it. Like if you yeah. already got that, you got it, you can move on. So we're, so I'll be, I'm working with, um, uh, actually as a part of my studies uh, to design some more advanced curriculum to, to build some of these things uh, for us. And I think that will help at least me, I suspect if you talk to some other people in the group, they would say, oh yeah, we've, we're a tradition. We've got all these things. And I'm looking at it going, yeah, we, we, we're getting there. We're on the road there. Uh, we, we've got, but we've got work to do and we can make it better. Uh, maybe I've got my eye on the prize a little bit more than my, uh, my feet here firmly planted on the ground where we are, but that's okay too. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. We've got to have dreamers. Exactly. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you practice on your own as well. Uh, you know, yes, uh, I've, I have found practice, I mean, so many things have been hard in 2020, uh, but I found practice yeah. really difficult in 2020, which is odd, because you would think in times of turmoil, that's when human history shows us that so many people turn toward spirituality for solace, for a sense of control, turn, whether it's, whether it's prayer or magic or ceremony, but I don't know, something about this year, despite its tribulations, I found it more difficult uh, for myself to, to mm -hmm. practice. So a lot of the things that I used to do, some uh, tarot reading for myself uh, and others, but mostly for myself, have, uh, and even some, um, some just some of the daily practice I used to do, lighting candles, saying some prayers, honoring some gods and goddesses that, that have been important to me for, for quite some time. A lot of that just felt like it was just one thing thing too much uh, mm -hmm. to handle this year. So I'm looking forward to sort of rededicating myself to some of what was my daily practice and trying to reconstitute that uh, and, and what that's going to look like. Because now that I've not done it for a while, I do sort of feel a sense of a sense of the opportunity to rebuild it in a way that maybe just doesn't have to look exactly the way it did. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm, it, I'm gonna, I'm interested to see see what comes out of it. Uh, so yeah, it could be interesting. The the yeah. one thing that I have maintained, I do, uh, I, I do have a shrine downstairs um, uh, to Hestia. I've worked with Hestia for, for quite some time. Uh, I worked from home even before uh, COVID. I was uh, uh, working for the University of Illinois, even though I lived in Massachusetts and then later Virginia. So it became it just became a full-time remote job. But as being around the house for the whole time, I just felt like uh, a deity figure that has connections to hearth and home and house and family felt like a good being with which to at least build uh, something of a relationship. So that's the one that maintained. Uh, yeah. Other other devotional practices that I that I've that I developed over the course of the last decade or so, 
uh, all felt like they weren't needed right now. Um, uh, although you can see behind me is some, there's Athena sort of over my left shoulder. Oh yeah. And, uh, and, yes. and, and, and uh, whatnot. So like the, the shrines are still there and there's, there's, there's uh, seven day pillar candles there. So I, I'm not saying the, the daily practice has gone completely out the window, but, um, uh, but it, it has felt different for the last bunch of years or the mm. last bunch of months, excuse me. Yeah. I mean, I, um, I really miss coven workings because you know, I, yeah. my thing is I love working with other people and um, <laughs> I miss that so much. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's interesting to me because I did uh, in the 90s, I did a lot of online work and this was before the internet had pictures uh, yeah. mostly. <laughs> so, uh, so I remember doing some rituals with folk online when it was only text wow. and uh, things like that. And eventually that moved into a space where we could at least build like e-shrines and and things of that sort and use some imagery to uh to do what we were doing uh and then eventually we got some basic voice capabilities so like and it was right about that point where i then had the opportunity to do it face to face and so i stopped doing online stuff as much mm. and it's been interesting now to get to make the jump from like 2003 and 4 technology to 2020 technology to be able to build a Zoom thing and to be able to uh, use some, you know, freely available uh, royalty-free music in the background while doing a, a ceremony and uh, meshing the microphone input with the musical input with the screen and the video capture. So I've had I've had some good fun over the course of the last bunch of months building uh, some interesting processes using. The internet specifically and trying to make it a medium that allows for some some creative exploration but yeah i got to admit i'm really hoping that the firefly house that we can get together uh this year because we yeah. we haven't we didn't and i mean pagans generally many of us do our thing outside and we yeah. could rem have remained socially distanced and masked and and uh all that jazz but we just felt pretty strongly that if we became if all of us became sick and it hit the Washington Post that the COVID coven was in Washington DC, mm. we're just like, no, we don't, we don't need this. It's really fine. <laughs> we'll take a year. We'll take a year off. <laughs> yes, yeah. it, it will be okay. Um, but yeah, I agree with you. I'm really hoping that this year, come summertime, fall or so, that we might be able to uh, to feel comfortable getting back together again, um, and uh, and doing some of the the latter half of the calendar seasons uh, holidays as a as events again we'll yeah see. We'll in the meantime <laughs> i wish there was a feature on zoom that would allow you to arrange the participants in a circle oh that's an interesting point you do only get squares don't you yeah and Just, of course nobody gets the same order yeah, uh, yeah so, so like yeah. you know if you say right okay uh we'll all take it in turns to say our check-in or our or our contribution yeah. to the online ritual or whatever it is then the person who's facilitating has to remember who's spoken and go right okay you yeah. next you next you next it would just be so there, good if there was a circle <laughs> sorry i didn't mean to cut you off um no. there is no a technology i actually encountered it first working with an organization out of the uk so i don't know if it is a if it's a uk tech or if it's a european company building it uh but it builds a virtual space like a conference room Oh. Uh, and so, uh, so members of the video conference can build an avatar and the avatar sits in a chair and you can, you can, the avatar will move a little bit while it speaks, while you speak. And it's interesting technology, but at the moment it's very, it's very young mm -hmm. and it doesn't have a lot of controls for people who are visually impaired uh, and things like that. So like, they've got a lot of work to do, I think, before it's going to be able to really hit a mainstream, but some of the tech that you're describing uh, that would allow us to construct a space virtually. Mm. um is there and i mean um i can't yeah i just i don't name, i don't but, actually want it to yeah. be an avatar though i just want it to be you know yeah here's, here's the thing you can arrange <laughs> the photo the the, the video fair. feeds in a circle that would be great <laughs> it would be nice yeah yeah <laughs> oh well one day yeah. yeah um yeah so uh do you have a favorite book on queer paganism I was thinking about this. Um, I think it's going to probably be a similar answer to some of the ones that others have given. Uh, the Lee Harrington um, compilation of essays is fantastic. Uh, I think it's just called Queer Magic. It is, yeah. Uh, and I'm always confused because there's another book with that exact same name by another person. Yes. Um, 
which and I must get hold those, of. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, there's another one, like there's a London, Ohio. And I'm just like, no, no, that's no. Don't, what, what were you thinking? Why would you make, the, why would you reuse this name of a city in the world that's so important? Yeah, uh, we have that, the London, that, Ontario plop, as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like, we, we it's just, no, there should be one of them, <laughs> but yeah. there's not enough words. Um, so um, in that book, though, the actual essay that Lee Harrington offered in it, uh, is one that I go back to a lot and it describes queering, essentially queering the circle. So instead of circling and calling North, South, East, West or Northeast, Southwest, depending on how, whatever, whatever order uh, tradition might want to do it in, uh, specifically working with Northeast, Southeast, Southwest and Northwest mm. and doing that as an intentional means by which to work with sort of the in-between powers. Mm. So in between earth and air is dust yeah. and and uh the sort of uh, sort of dry deserty uh maybe feels uh whereas in between say fire and water would be steam yes and, and that and and that there's that there's different elemental and, yeah and earth and water would be these. mud yeah mud yeah yeah um swamp or wetland perhaps yeah uh, to, to put it in a, in a you know in different fields um so that's been something I've gone back to a couple of times uh, yeah. while writing my own rituals uh, and and working with my own ideas because it's just such a simple mm. tool. I mean, it's interesting because it, I, I thought of sort of intermediate elements around the circle years ago, mm -hmm. but it never occurred oh, yeah. to me that it was a, a queer perception. I just kind of thought, yeah. hey, that would be a neat thing to do and never got around to writing a ritual about it. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, there's so many things I think that all of us are just like, yeah, that's really interesting. I've never had that thought before. And then it's like a decade later, you see somebody wrote a whole book about it. And you're like, oh man, yeah, I could have, yeah, I could have done that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, my contribution to weird elements is the idea of um, gas, solid, liquid, and plasma. Plasma, sure. Quarters. So, and sure. that's a really interesting thing to do. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I really like that essay. And I also like the Queering the Wheel of the Year one in that book. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, that was in that book. Yes. That was a really helpful. Yeah, I've, I'd never, I hadn't heard of them before. And yeah, but it's a really good essay. I'm like, wow, oh, so good. Yeah. <laughs> Make notes. Well, because it, it takes the Wheel of the Year story out of the sort of strange ancient world quasi incestuous relationship between gender binaries and yeah. and turns it into a different way of understanding yeah. the process of the year well, i've never used that very yeah. heteronormative <laughs> story anyway it's yeah. never it's never <laughs> been part of my practice it wasn't no, how it's... i was trained it's you know i don't i don't really know where it came from but it's no not part, i don't it's either never actually, been part of my it. practice um uh, uh, so what, i think uh, the traditional meanings yeah. of the festivals but i really like exactly that that wheel of the year i thought it was really helpful mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah totally yeah it was good so uh you had a blog but uh, oh ah before we get onto the oh. blog um i forgot to ask do you have a definition of queer magic Ooh. i think all magic in some ways is sort of lowercase q queer it's an attempt to change it's an attempt to be in between or to uh as i like to put it unquo the status um like it. so there there is uh so i think that on some level the the act of of performing magic of being a magician uh just to stick with the same root word um is itself somewhat inherently queer um that said i think there is like there are ways to perform magic that would lend itself more toward uh, queerness. And I think magic that supports magic that supports your own self in ways that you might not be finding elsewhere, magic that you can perform in a way that helps to support those who seek that authenticity uh, mm -hmm. is, is, you know, I think I th the, I, I said it before, and I, I think that there is a real tie for me between being who you are and queerness. Mm. And that is perhaps because I spent 
you know, 35 years or so not being entirely sure who I was. Uh, and so finding that then felt so good that it's made an indelible connection to, for me between authenticity and being queer. Mm. And so I think that when I think of the idea of queer magic, there is something uh, in there as well about supporting that authenticity mm. that um, anything that one does magical or otherwise that allows you to be true to your own highest ideals um, is going is going to in some way, I think, queer the situation um, mm. because so much of life is about not always living up to our highest ideals and saying, and I'm not saying compromise is bad or that we, we shouldn't have to be in conversation with people whom, with whom we disagree and find a way to work together. But I think that when we sacrifice things that are truly and deeply held within us, there's a consequence and we have to be willing to face it. And if you are willing to face it, if this is a, a point at which you need to face it, then great. You know, that, that's a determination only we can make. But when we are seeking those ideals, when we are supporting those ideals, it is inherently queer. Mm. I mean, for me, it feels I, it feels to me like magic is inherently queer and um and it's but it's hard to unpack why it just kind of feels that way and i mm. think you've just done a really good job of unpacking a lot of the reasons why so yeah that's great um something about liminality and mm -hmm. um and also the fact that the you know the status quo wants everybody to fit in their neat little boxes mm -hmm. and queerness refuses mm -hmm. to do that so yeah i completely agree mm -hmm. definitely um well it's an in-between thing queerness and magic that yeah. you use the word liminal liminal liminality like there is a there's a state of being both and mm. uh both to queerness and to magic rather than either or and and much of the rest of the world is frequently either or mm. uh, i can either buy this or buy that i don't have enough money for both and you know you know that's that's the that's the state of of choices that we all mm. have to make well and but, the fact that everything right now is so polarized about everything so oh sure yeah yeah yeah, yeah exactly exactly yeah, so true. Yeah, so you had a blog, um, but um, so yeah, tell us about what happened. Yeah, so I, I, uh... I guess uh, full point of order. The, I worked for a while at Patheos.com working with the Agora blog. Uh, I very rarely wrote for that one. I actually did write on the Interfaith uh, blog. It was called Wild Garden for a while. That one's, I mean, I'm sure the posts are still online, but it mm -hmm. hasn't been written uh, for quite some time. Um, and I worked and wrote for a while at Pagan Activist. Uh, dot com. So like, there's been a couple of sites that I have written on. Um, I don't, I've never really maintained like my own personal blog. It's something that I keep like aspirationally thinking I should do. And then I just never actually do it. Um, so, but at Patheos, at the Agora, by me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so at, at Patheos with the Agora blog, I was, I was the editor. And so I was supporting um, it started out, we were able to do about three or four posts a week. And I think while I was working there, we got it up to the point where we might've been doing closer to five or six a week, uh, a day off here or there. And a couple of months we nailed it. We got like a post every day and that felt good. Um, but, um, man, it was a while ago now, years ago, uh, when Patheos was doing the contract renegotiation with everybody and it became clear that somewhat legitimately, I, I understand their point of view, they wanted to reserve the right to remove content that they thought reflected poorly on Patheos uh, or on the values uh, of, of Patheos as a site. And that became contentious because the financial backing of Patheos is evangelical Christianity and dollars coming from that community. Mm. And so there was some worry and some fear that if we were talking about things that were too queer, or if we were saying things that would be in opposition or cause some consternation for the, the money backers of the organization, that 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 reservation of that, that right to, to remove content might go from something that was rude, insensitive, or insulting down to just, oh, we disagree with this, or um, you know, this violates our deeply held religious belief in, in being, you know, terrible bigots. <laughs> so yes. we, we're going to just remove this post. 
Um, so yeah, I ended up, I ended up leaving. Uh, I didn't sign the new contract, uh, and, and sort of, uh, decided at the time, not only to leave the site and not, not work there anymore, but I actually took the money that I'd earned working there and donated it. Uh, I don't remember which two organizations I had to split it in half. Cause I, I of course didn't save the money. Like it had already been used and spent. So I had to like save up the amount of money and then I donated it. And then I saved oh, up the other much good. money and I donated it. Um, so, cause I felt like I didn't even want to, I didn't, af after the, the, all the rigmarole and all of the, the consternation around, uh, sexuality and gender, uh, that the pagan community has been working through for the last decade or so mm. that this site felt like it was not the place for me. Yeah. Um, and so I moved on. Yeah. Um, as did I at the same time. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I never made any money out of Pathios, so I didn't, well, fair. I didn't have to do that. <laughs> but um, Yeah. I, that was, that was the benefit of being the editor for a bunch of other people's work because it allowed three, four five posts a week, which allowed the, the clicks and the revenue to come in on the site. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it, it, I, I, when, when I decided to donate the money, I actually talked to all the bloggers that had really done the work uh, to put that money together. And that's, and we decided where to send it. And unfortunately it was long enough ago that I don't remember what organizations we chose, uh, but that's okay. Yeah, uh, but I still and, applaud and, you for uh, doing it. I think that's very- Yeah, it just, yeah. it just felt like the right thing to do. Yeah. It felt like it, it, it admittedly wasn't that much money. It was like 600 bucks over the whole time that I had worked there. So it wasn't like it was this vast sum or quantity of, of money, but it also just sort of felt like it was, wrong it was money that was tainted uh over by the whole situation yeah. um and some of the people that were on the board related to patheos or related to the the parent organization that oversaw patheos it wasn't the the website itself um were really just odious individuals with whom i i did not want to be associated yeah um, i mean for me the the bottom line was the um i think it was the the links the organizations they had links to like mm -hmm. the NRA, um, mm -hmm. which I am completely and utterly opposed to, and also sure. the, the, the ACLJ, which I hadn't heard of, but when I found out that they were anti-gay and oh, yeah. you know, I'm like, I cannot be doing stuff to benefit an organization that has links with organizations exactly. to which I am fundamentally opposed. Yeah, uh, and, yeah, I just, and I didn't it, like the cut of the contract either. So yeah. no, yeah, I, the, the, yeah. I mean, the contract sort of precipitated the contract negotiation precipitated the discovery of all of the other ties to, right. to organizations uh, like the ACLJ. Um, and so on the one hand, the, 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 the fact that the contracts came up and it sort of caused us to take a second look at the contracts and that second look caused us to all take a closer examination of for and with whom we were working. Mm. Um, yeah, and, and, and I'm actually really happy though that, that Patheos continues because uh, I think the voices that are there are extremely necessary and yeah. I read most of them uh still to this day so it's not I, I i i hope that there's not a lot of enmity between people who stayed and people who left and people who joined like yeah that, i mean that, I that just wasn't feel, the thing it was just yeah, wrong for me same and i think you know i don't feel any beef with the people who stayed because yeah. that's their choice and they didn't see it in the same light as we did and that's fine exactly um, that's, yeah but it wasn't comfortable for me so that was that exactly yeah um but you know there there's some good voices on there and producing some great content and um and there doesn't seem to have been a massive amount of interference that we can see no not that we can see from the outside yeah, yeah. i i even at the time i really didn't expect that there would be that that truly felt like it was a line in a fairly boilerplate contract that a few people glommed onto as censorship when it really, I don't think was ever intended mm. to be that. Could it have become so? Yes. Um, but I don't, as a person, tend to truly, I don't like slippery slope arguments, the what if. It's like, mm. well, we as a species have been pretty good at slippery slopes. We tend to just build staircases. Like we, we, we're fine, like we know, we, we're very good at knowing when we've crossed a line, maybe not right away. <laughs> Sometimes it takes a while. Um, but I also think that we're also pretty good at knowing when we're walking up to the line. 
Mm. And and so the contract itself, I think it was hinky. And I think there were parts of it that I, I didn't want to sign it for, mm. sign and, and be a part of it. But it also didn't feel like it was wrong. Like it, and and I really felt like it was the it was the catalyst for some of the other things that needed to come to yeah, light. Yeah, I mean, us. it was the other stuff that really concerned yeah. me. I think. Well, I there was one occasion when I had a post on my blog, which was reposted on the main Pathos page, sure. and they changed the title of the post. Yeah, and if you had read bit. like, uh, and the title implied the exact opposite of what I had oh, intended. The, their, their new title implied the exact opposite and that annoyed yeah, me um, that's, that's, but that was that's before rough. all of this stuff mm -hmm. so yeah. I don't know um, yeah I have I have a number of journalist friends who uh, maybe over some beers or just sort of in the conversations uh, they've admitted that they've written whole articles and submitted it up to their editors and then somebody else slaps a headline on it and it's like this is not what I this is not what I would have chosen can we but you can't like sometimes you just sometimes the editor comes by slaps the new headline on it or and you're just like well well at least I still yeah. have the byline <laughs> yeah I think it, well it was just the fact that it completely changed the meaning yeah um, and that's 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 rough yeah and then <laughs> I had to write a... another post to, to hey emphasize, you know, <laughs> which didn't if all get you it. read was the headline then <laughs> yeah which didn't get onto the main page of course not no yeah <laughs> so fun 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 times yeah yeah well i hope that there will be a new um aggregator website that will do some kind of website that that does the same job uh one day yeah it would be interesting to see what happens there because on some level i think i think patheos is sort of using up a lot of the oxygen in that space and there's I don't actually think there has to be a reason for somebody to not go mm. to Patheos. I think if you look at the situation, you read the contract, you look at the connections and you say to yourself, I can work with this, go for it. Cause you're going to, it's, it's where you're going to find the audience. It's already there. Mm. And so it's, I, I had, as we were leaving Patheos, I registered pagans.today as a website. I don't think I have it anymore. It might still be in my list. I don't know. Um, <laughs> and um and I had thought that I was going to try to build something. Uh, and my time with the Pagan Newswire Collective was aggregating the content from all of the different news bureaus that had can become a part of that project. Mm. Um, and that was national and international and multilingual. We had a few Spanish language sites uh, sort of in that network, which was really cool. And so I'd had the, the experience that might have helped build something up. Um, but it was right before we moved to DC and, and it, there was just other stuff going on in life. And then, uh, I just sort of realized that I don't think that it needed to be there. Like Patheos is fine. I didn't like it. I didn't want to keep doing it, but it's actually really useful and it's doing its own thing. Um, so we'll see. I do think there's opportunities for, for a space that is pagan, for pagans plus the the public uh, kind of a thing, as opposed to Patheos, which often feels like it is for the public and not always necessarily for a lot of cross channel talk or even cross blog talk. Mm. Uh, I would I would be interested in trying to create a space that has a lot more to do with the exchange of ideas across the religious lines or across the blog lines, um, and that's something that. Patheos hasn't necessarily done, although sometimes a post in one place will get conversation started over here, which will then start a conversation over here. But typically the person writing this site writes the site and that's what you have going on there. Mm. Um, and so it could, I, I, I've often played with in my mind, what would it look like to build a similar site to Patheos, which a bunch with a bunch of different bloggers who are writing their own thing, but that somehow encourages the opportunity for people to become to to create conversations between the authors in some ways mm. whether it's a conversation recorded and presented like this one or whether it's entirely in print so that you have the opportunity to stop and think and and design what your part in the dialogue is going to be mm. um, like the old synchro blogs in the um i don't know i guess early 20 uh, early 2010s that um people were 
people were getting together with a group of other bloggers and writing on a topic oh, sure. and then everybody would put out their post at the same time and link to each other's posts yeah exactly um so I, I really liked those and i thought it was a great yeah. idea well and and there's even a second step there we're way off topic but that's okay there's even a second step there where everybody writes their topic but then you actually then offer the opportunity for, for people to respond or to create the conversation whether mm -hmm. that's in the comments or in some kind of moderated forum where everybody writes their post but then you bring all of those authors from that post together in a zoom call and actually then dialogue about yeah. the topics you sort of let everybody get their their ideas down and formalized in their own way and then you start bashing them together and see what happens when they on the other side um That'd yeah cool. there's room yeah. I've, I've got some ideas i've got i've often wanted to i've wanted a new project i feel like i had some good pagany projects through the late aughts in the 2010s and it's been a while since i had a really good pagany project um so yeah, I, I think it's probably sometime in the 2020s, I'll come up with something I want to try to try to do or, or a project that somebody else does that I want to help out with and get back involved. But uh, for the moment, just sort of wait and see what happens. Yeah, yeah. Well, sounds exciting. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, uh, I feel like, you know, I do software development during the day. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm like, right, I'm doing something else now. Um, That's fair. <laughs> yeah, maybe when I retire. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That would be nice. I don't know. I can see going that from here. <laughs> yeah. Well, and for me, unfortunately, going back to school uh, when I was 39 was probably not the best way to have a retirement. So uh, <laughs> right now, I'm not I'm not so sure, but I got, a, I got student loans to pay off. I just finished off paying my undergrad, and then I'm yeah. now going to have to pay off grad school. It's like, why did I, why did I do this again? But because uh, it was yeah, fun you know. and you like no learning. it's been it's been great yeah. I'm, i i uh, even megan my partner she she has said to me that uh she hasn't seen me this happy in a long time just being back in academia being back and doing studies uh and so i got to think that that's worth something even if it does require the payment back of student loans over time yeah so <laughs> yeah i was lucky enough to go to university the first time around when at uh, the very very end of student grants there you go yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, that's a nice way yeah it was good but unfortunately yeah. it also meant that the bank manager had no idea that that you know you needed a big overdraft because the grants had been frozen so yeah yeah uh, yeah yeah it was kind of <laughs> it was a strange time <laughs> yeah really yeah but so yeah, yeah. so cool well, so thank you so much and uh, yeah, look forward happy. to seeing whatever projects you come up with um, yeah. and uh, keep chatting on the Inclusive Wicked Discord channel, which was fun. I will do so. Yeah. And uh, have a great 2021. Yeah, that's the plan. That's true. It is. Uh, it is New Year's Eve. Happy New Year. Yeah. Uh, happy New Year. Yeah. What, about 12 hours early. <laughs> yes. <laughs> cool. <laughs> can't, it can't be worse than 2020, surely. Uh, I'm uh, not going to jinx it. <laughs> uh, no. Fingers crossed. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it's been great. great. Yeah. yeah and thank you so much for having me. Your pleasure. It's been great.